Uh, Jeffrey Chaucer utilizes two texts, Crown of Fowls and Squire's Tale, to explore the influence of audience on female voice through the use of talking birds. In Parliament of Fowls, the female formal eagle's voice appears suppressed under the articulation of arguments in the jockeying of the male Purcell of eagles as they bid for mating privileges with her. As well as by the noise of the lesser bird's opinions on which mate she should choose. Indeed, the formal speaks in nearly two stanzas of this work, creating a surface appearance that her voice is powerless and irrelevant. A position expressed by Lincoln Tuttle Hansen and implied by Russell A. Peck. Likewise, in discussing Squire's tale, critics Leslie Kordecki, Susan Crane, and Catherine Lynch argue that although it appears as though feminine thought is expressed through the voices of talking animals, it is in fact suppressed by the fact that only women hear the falcon's complaint. Despite the fact that Parliament's audience is nearly exclusively upper and lower class male, and Squire's audience uniquely female, a deeper reading of Chaucer's treatment of these female birds may lead the reader to believe this contrast is Chaucer's socially acceptable alternative to a bird criticism of the manner in which women conform to societal norms related to gender. Juxtaposition of the treatment of female talking birds in the Parliament of Fowls and Squire's Tale shows that the gender of the audience who listens to the female voice informs whether she will allow the audience to hear an honest depiction of what her thoughts and feelings are. Through the use of the fantastical talking birds, Chaucer is able to illustrate these differences and demonstrate the importance of gender of of the gender of the audience in determining what is shared and what is kept at it. Early on in the Bird's Parliament, Chaucer allows the royal Tercel to interrupt the formal selection of him or anyone else as her mate with boastful speech meant to convince her that he is the best choice available to her. Although this appears to function in keeping with the theme of suppression of the female voice, it is actually a demonstration of Chaucer's in-depth knowledge of birds in the real world. Chaucer's Tercells make their claims for her on the basis of length of service, in addition to their decision to engage in battle to win her affection, as would occur in their natural setting. The formal some response to the parading of the Tercells is, quote, for shame all waxing again the hue, when she heard all this, she neither answered well, nay say to miss, unquote. The formal blushes, a non-verbal act in silence. This operates in contrast to the mating rituals of birds of prey and marks the initial indication that the formal's audience moderates the response. According to Charles O. MacDonald, the negotiations for her marriage event should have transpired secretly, but instead are mentioned in the face of the whole company. Given, this type of discourse, given that this type of discourse would not traditionally, in systems of courtly love, be put on display to be witnessed, the formal silence and distress make sense. Her privacy has been violated in front of a large, almost exclusively male audience, and the only dignified response is silence. After all the birds have had their say, nature asks the formal to select a mate. Again, in keeping with actual birds of prey, she declines to choose. In her dreadful voice, the, the formal says, quote, I ask for respite for to advise in me, and after that to have my choice all free. This all in sum that I would speak and say, you get no more, although you do me die, end quote. Why, if she has more to say, would the formal refuse to speak, even if put to death? This is an extreme reluctance, and the reader may reasonably believe that the formal does not prohibit it from speaking freely, but rather does not wish to speak candidly in front of the other birds. It seems that because she was stripped of her privacy, the formal instead uses her ability to be silent as a means to regain her position and autonomy in front of this seemingly unwanted, nearly all-male audience. Due to the formal's nature-given ability to choose her response to the proceedings, the formal's silence becomes her voice. Aside from the formal, the only other two female birds present are the goose and the turtle dove, the silly bird and the love bird. It stands to reason that both these birds, assigned to the lower classes of avian life, would not present a large enough female presence to encourage the active use of voice from the female. 
In contrast, the falcon in the squire's tale has absolutely no trouble speaking her mind. In fact, she hardly stops talking. <laughs> She's so loud. Um, she also has a small audience, a solitary woman, possibly with an all-female retinue, with whom she can engage in female-to-female -female discourse regarding the adultery of her mate. Adrian Rich, in Compulsory Heterosexuality, explains that, quote, the, that the, quote, woman-identified experience includes the sharing of a rich inner life, the bonding against male tyranny, and the giving and receiving of practical support, unquote, demonstrating a tremendous need for women to be heard by one another, as well as a need to listen and empathize with one another in a space free of masculinity. In a nurturing environment where the falcon selects her audience, there is no need for secrecy or privacy. She can tell all and know that she will be treated with the sensitivity and care the falcon truly needs in her suicidal state. When we, uh, we first see the peregrine falcon covered with blood as she attempts to peck herself to death, Canacy, who has a ring that allows her to communicate with birds, calls out to the falcon, asking if it is love that has caused her to try to kill herself. Secondarily, she offers to use herbal medicine to heal the falcon's wounds. This sets the tone for the falcon's audience. Feminine, caring, nurturing, and helpful. Unlike in Parliament of Fowls, there is no pressure to be anything or act in a specific way. The falcon is already at her lowest point, and Canacy reaches out with a helping hand and kind words. The falcon acknowledges their bond of femaleness, saying, quote, compassion, my fair Canacy, a very woman benignity that nature in your principles hath set, unquote. This serves to inform the reader that what is to happen is between women, with a promise for honest, open discourse fueled by the presupposition of empathy women share with one another. Homosocial demonstrations between men, such as we observe in Parliament of Fowls, frequently take the form of conquest and surrender. It is important to note that between women, homosociality slides along a separate continuum that is grounded in the common, shared female experience within a male-dominated society. Canacy and her mates can relate to the Falcon's experience even if they have not lived it, because it is an experience they have seen before in others and could themselves be subject to at any point in the future. On account of the shared knowledge within the overall culture surrounding womanhood, the Falcon's female audience can experience an immediate sensation of empathy precisely because the Falcon's experience is far from unique. This is most clearly evidenced by Canacy's immediate inference that the Falcon's suicide attempt is related to matters of the heart, as well as her immediate decision to take the Falcon into her care. The Falcon tells the story of being courted at length by a tercelet in accordance with the mating rituals of birds of prey. After many a year, the Falcon accepts the tercelet and mates with him. Chaucer then departs from what is typical in ma the mating rituals of real-life birds of prey. After submission to the tercelet, he strays, betraying her for a kite that suddenly he loved so that all his love is clean for me and God. Unlike in real life, where the falcon would simply find a mate, Chaucer's falcon here falls into extreme melancholy, saying, I am more without a remedy. Interestingly, and without any apparent consent from the falcon, Canacy involves all her women, who seek to ease the bird's mental pain while healing the physical wounds. Although the falcon is not asked if her audience might grow, it is understood that because everyone in her audience is female, the falcon is safe. She can, in effect, function as though no audience existed at all. Her voice, no matter how piteous it may be, can be heard and is understood. The squire here mentions that Canacy builds the falcon anew, a place of security in which the falcon will heal. Although the squire describes in great detail its decoration, it could appear to the reader that the entirety of the falcon's experience with Canacy is the meal that allows her to rest and heal. She is able, because of Canacy's feminine sympathies, to release her melancholy through the telling of her story, to obtain medical treatment, and to recapture her ability to love. The feminine bond, the transparency with which a female can be seen by another female provides the foundational relief the falcon needs in order to move on. Her audience not only hears her, it heals her. It is apparent that although Chaucer ends this tale abruptly, 
he leaves the reader understanding that the women take care of each other, relying on their ability to see their audience as themselves and to respond to one another with empathy, compassion, kindness, and the ability to heal. In examining the differences in how these two female birds are able to utilize their voices, it becomes immediately obvious that audience plays a larger role in what, if anything, is actually said. Under the scrutiny of the entire bird world, the female uses silence to express her desire to maintain privacy. Likewise, with a sympathetic all-female audience, the falcon is able to freely grieve her lover's betrayal, which ultimately saves her life. Chaucer is clearly making commentary on the voice of the human female through these birds, demonstrating that women have thought, expectation, desire, decorum, and a sense of situational appropriateness as defined by the gender norms of their time. In a world where a large audience might commonly be perceived as the eradication or suppression of female voice, Chaucer raises questions as to whether the voice is actually silenced, or if a woman's silence, or lack thereof, speaks louder than words for her in her body system. Mm -hmm. The end of the medieval period was a unique time in the history of Europe. At the dawn of the Renaissance, Europe went through many social and economic changes, which triggered a rebirth of knowledge and learning. The plague, which consumed Europe from 1346 to 1353, contributed to conspicuous changes in European society. Giovanni Boccaccio writes the Decameron between 1344 and 1350. It is published in 1350. <coughs> the story is narrated by young women and men fleeing the Black Plague as it enters Florence, Italy. The text is both provocative and progressive as the author scrutinizes the inequalities affecting the women of his society. The Decameron provides a rare glimpse into proto-feminist thought at the birth of the Renaissance. The sixth tale of the seventh day, the tale of Madonna Filippa, is the incarnation of Boccaccio's proto-feminist notions. There is some confusion among scholars as to what purpose Madonna Filippa's story serves in the text, which this paper seeks to resolve once and for all. In order to grasp the significance of this tale, we must first understand the condition of women during Boccaccio's lifetime and investigate how the plague affected them. In the medieval period, women were expected to be submissive to their male counterparts. Whether it was a husband or a father, a woman was to remain subordinate. After the plague annihilated a huge portion of Europe's population, society entered a transitional period, during which numerous changes took place. An important point to note is that many people benefited from the death of their relatives by way of inheritance. Therefore, social classes were changing. Entire families were destroyed and replaced <coughs> with a new aristocracy. Additionally, as a result of the decline in the population, there were a plethora of jobs and not enough people to fill them. Europe lacked the manpower it had possessed before the plague. However, there was a solution to amend this issue, an untapped resource in medieval society, the woman. Women began to fill in the gaps in the workforce and society began to reevaluate the role of the woman. Women were now part of the laboring community. More women were becoming financially independent, and there was a decline in marriage overall, and more marriages started to occur later in life in comparison to the average age of partners prior to the plague. Boccaccio writes the Decameron in the midst of this progressive era for women. These changes in society influenced his writing and propelled him toward a deep consideration of the plights of medieval women, particularly the limitations placed on female sexual liberty. Tobias Foster Gitz of Columbia University discusses these limitations in his article, Boccaccio's Valley of Women, Fetishized Foreplay in Decameron 6. Quote, indeed, this idea of a sexual economy defined in terms of loading and unloading is introduced in the problem itself, where Boccaccio states that whereas men are provided with many means of alleviating their burden of thoughts occasioned by erotic frustration, through such activities as hunting and fishing, 
women have fewer venues for such a lightening of their load. The Decameron, Boccaccio claims, is itself designed to fulfill this function for women. Since Boccaccio casts his text in the role of candor, the literary success of his text is inextricably bound up with its erotic success. A text engineered to generate erotic tension must at the same time perform the midwife-like function of delivering women of erotic tumescence." End quote. Getz draws attention to Boccaccio's sympathetic attitude toward the inequalities experienced by women in his society. It is important to remember the attitude of the author toward this issue as the story of Madonna Filippa unfolds with the issue of sexual autonomy at its core. In the introduction of the Decameron, the author makes it clear that he is writing for a female audience. Quote, whenever most of these ladies, I consider how compassionate you are by nature, end quote. From the outset, his main concern is how the women reading his text will react to it. There can be no argument made against the point that the Decameron was crafted for women. This first must be understood before any accurate analysis of the text may be made. Also, at the introduction of the text, the author discusses the issue of a lack of attendees or nurses to care for the ill during the play. He points out that as a result of this, many women would accept a male nurse and consequently had to reveal their bodies to male attendees. He states that many women were comfortable with this and that this phenomenon may have triggered a change in the attitudes of all women after the plague. Quote, this practice was perhaps in the days that followed the pestilence, the cause of looser morals in the women who survived the plague, end quote. He opens the text with this defense of the changes he sees in the women of the society by justifying their causes. As the Decameron continues, he delves deeper into the female experience and imagines a society that applauds the independent woman. The most prominent evidence of his proto-feminist thought appears in the seventh tale of the sixth day, the story of Madonna Philippa as told by Philostrator. Essentially, Madonna Philippa is caught by her husband with another man, and instead of murdering them both, her husband intends to exercise a statute of the city to have her burned for her infidelity. He takes her to court where she speaks before the judge, and ultimately, she escapes death and produces a change in the laws of the city. Before speaking to the judge, Madonna Philippa is advised by her family and friends to not appear in court. She decides to go against the wishes of her loved ones. Quote, she decided that she would rather confess the truth and die with a courageous heart than fleeing like a coward, live in exile condemned in absentia, and show herself unworthy of such a lover as the man in whose arms she had rested the night before. End quote. Madonna Philippa's thoughts here are more masculine than they are feminine with regard to the gender roles of the medieval period. She wants to speak her mind and to be heard. This attitude foreshadows her actions in court. Just as she goes against the advice of her loved ones, she will also go against the advice of her judge. At first sight, the judge is dazzled by her beauty, quote, gazing at the lady and finding her to be most beautiful and very well-bred, as well as the religious, <coughs> indeed. As her own words bore witness, the Podesta took pity on her and was afraid she might confess to something which would force him, in order to fulfill his duty, to condemn her to death." End quote. The judge values her for her beauty, for her sheer aesthetic value. Her courage is endearing, but it is not what he admires. The judge's feelings toward her are a reflection of medieval society's attitudes towards women. Women were valued for their ability to please the eye, to be a lovely possession, and to bear beautiful children. The judge has already dismissed the possibility that Madonna Philippa has anything valuable to say in her defense, and decided that he must save her from condemning herself. After the judge presents the charges laid upon her, Madonna Philippa states, quote, But as I am sure you know, the law should be equal for all, and should be passed with the consent of the people they affect. In this case, these conditions are not fulfilled, for this law applies only to us poor women, who are much better able than men to satisfy a larger number. Furthermore, when this law was put into effect, not a single woman gave her consent, nor was any one of them ever consulted about it. Therefore, it may quite rightly be called a bad law." End quote. 
The first point of significance to be addressed in her speech here is the desire for equality for women. She challenges the judge to consider the flaw in the statute that her husband is attempting to use against her. The author employs some cunning language in this passage. The lady refers to her gender as us poor women, seemingly admitting the inadequacy of the female gender. However, directly after this supposed admission of the insufficiency of her gender, she proudly states that women are much better able than men to satisfy a larger number, which on the surface seems like she is only acknowledging that women outnumber men, when truly she is alluding to the fact that women possess a stronger libido than men, which leads her to her next statement in which she addresses the issue with her husband unabashedly. Quote, if he has always taken of me whatever he needed, and however much pleased him, what was I supposed to do then? And what am I to do now with what is left over? Should I throw it to the dogs? Is it not much better to give it to a gentleman who loves me more than himself, rather than let it go to waste or spoil?" End quote. Boccaccio's proto-feminist views reach a climax in this passage. Madonna Filippa confesses her need and right to sexual satisfaction. Here, the author has reversed the gender roles and argues <coughs> that women desire and should have the right to the same sexual freedoms as men. Speaking through Madonna Filippa, Boccaccio points out women do indeed have the same desire for sexual satisfaction as men, although yet still society fails to acknowledge or permit it. The author uses the reaction of the people in the court to reinforce his opinions. In reality, society would have rejected Madonna Filippa's behavior and testimony. But within the world of the Decameron, she is embraced and accepted, even celebrated. Quote, all of a sudden, and almost in a single voice, they cried out that the lady was right and had spoken well. End quote. The citizens of the city unanimously agree with the lady. The author creates a society that welcomes the sexual autonomy of the female gender. The final lines of the tale further prove that the author's intent is to encourage and embrace proto-feminist thought. Quote, and the lady, now free and happy, and resurrected from the flames, so to speak, returned to her home in triumph, end quote. The lady, who for the author is representative of all women in society, is referred to as now being free and happy. The message Boccaccio is extolling here is that all women deserve to be free and happy, free from the inequalities placed on them by a patriarchal society and enjoying a life of independence. He speaks of Madonna Filippa as being resurrected, experiencing a rebirth. She has been transformed by her freedom. Rather than demonizing the triumph of a woman, Boccaccio turns it into a message of hope for all women in his society to whom he is writing the Decameron. Boccaccio's Madonna Filippa is a, a shining example of early feminist advocation. The author's message is quiet and covert, written in such a way that a male reader would most likely only see the humor in the tale and dismiss it as a witty story about politics and a clever lady. Kenneth Pennington of Syracuse University does exactly this in his article, A Note to Decameron 6.7, The Wit of Madonna Filippa. Quote, the story then derives its humor from Ocasio's parody of a legal maxim and of a biblical quotation. And these two subtle allusions give substance to a tale which might otherwise appear to be a shallow piece of wit." End quote. Surely, as Boccaccio assumed, many readers like Pennington gloss over the intention of the text and cling to the humor as its most valuable aspect. Written for a society, specifically the female gender, in post-plague Europe, the Decameron offers a view of a new world and a new society, reborn out of the destruction of the plague. Boccaccio confronts the issue of inequality between the genders and quite literally puts it on trial. <coughs> Through his writing in the seventh tale of the sixth day of the Decameron, he pushes for progress in the sexual liberation of women in his society. Boccaccio indeed was a feminist. Thank you.
Hitler's treatment of marriage in his Elizabethan era comedies remains largely accessible to 21st century readers and audiences. But understanding Measure for Measure, an early Jacobean comedy, requires an intimate familiarity with early modern customs of betrothal and clandestine marriage, as well as the Jacobean ecclesiastical court's jurisdiction over betrothed couples who flouted laws that required the church to solemnize their marriages. When Measure for Measure was staged at court on December 26, 1604, English common law recognized a couple's right to form a valid marriage through nothing more than mutual consent. As B.J. Sokol and Mary Sokol point out, these marriages, known as spousals, granted men and women considerable autonomy and control over their marital destiny, however theoretical. But illogical as it may seem, the church courts colloquially referred to as the body courts, had the authority to fine betrothed couples for entering into a clandestine marriage and failing to solemnize it in the church. In effect, a spousal in Shakespeare's England was often regarded as a valid but illicit marriage. And as I talk about the play, I'm inspired by the BBC Time Life production of 1979, the yeah. film adaptation that many of you may be familiar with. It stars uh, Tim Piggott Smith as Angelo, and as, uh, as Timothy Taunts, yes. as you pointed out yesterday in your paper, um, or in your introduction, um, Shakespeare's plays were meant to be watched, not necessarily read. This is sort of my bias, so I just wanted to let yeah. you know that I'm inspired by that production, so as I speak about it, you can keep that in mind. Um, measure for Measure raises questions about the validity of the respective marital states and sexual transgressions of three betrothed couples, Claudio and Juliet, Angelo and Mariana, and Lucio and Kate Keepdown. And today I confine my discussion to moral questions surrounding the sexual behavior of Claudio and Juliet a betrothed couple bound by a marital pre-contract considered valid under English common law. As Jonathan Bay has argued in his intellectual biography, Soul of the Age, the play's treatment of the sins of this couple resembles the body court's judgments upon actual couples charged with crimes associated with clandestine marriage in the 16th and 17th centuries. I propose that Measure for Measure's salacious courtroom ethos simulates the censure of the body courts as regards its judgment upon Claudio and Juliet. In doing so, the play may have drawn attention to England's Byzantine marriage laws and implicitly challenged the church court's increasingly punitive judgments against sexual misconduct after the 1604 changes to, to canon law. This would be under King James. Anne Barton observes that whereas the 1604 canon law clamped down on married couples that obtained a license without bans or parental consent, <coughs> marriages under such circumstances remain valid, though perhaps morally reprehensible. She observes that measure for measure and symboly, two Jacobean plays, are sensitive to stricter church laws on marriage solemnization and adultery displaying a changed and markedly less permissive attitude toward irregular sexual unions. To explain Measure for Measure's apparent sensitivity toward stricter church laws on marriage solemnization, we may address Bates' hypothesis that Shakespeare's imagination from his early years in Stratford may have been stirred by cases of sexual misconduct heard by the body courts. Bate notes that, quote, in a parish such as Stratford, the local consistory court would have been set up inside the church and would have included a raised seat for the judge, who was the vicar, and a large table for the notary and witnesses to sit around while the accused stood facing the judge. These low-level courts, under the archdeacon's jurisdiction, heard lively cases involving sexual misdemeanors related to betrothals, fornication, and other misdeeds such as adultery, abortion, happiness, and defamation. 
and I think also Bastardy came in there as well. These proceedings could take place either before the minister or local officials or be carried out publicly before Sunday morning services. From the standpoint of witnesses who found Sunday services long and dull, <laughs> watching local men or women stand before the judge and do penance for some sexual misdemeanor would have livened up proceedings and furnished good material for gossip. It would have been great theater. By 1603, around the time when Measure for Measure was composed, and not long before the 1604 canons were enacted, the courts were being criticized for being too lenient. With, the with this contemporary political landscape in mind, we can look closely at how Shakespeare might have fashioned the play as a series of legal trial contexts involving a judge and an accused. Later, we can consider why he would have done so. Measure for Measure's legal, quasi-legal, and punitive context include a ritual parading of the accused Claudio, a magistrate's court, a prison, and an outdoor public trial of five characters near Vienna's gate. Because the play includes no less than seven trial scenes and two formal pleadings for mercy, it has a palpable courtroom ethos that invites comparison with actual, lively, consistory court proceedings familiar to spectators. In particular, the play's public hearings of the sexual transgressions committed by Claudio, Pompey, Angelo, the Friar, and Lucio are rich in legal and quasi-legal interrogation, and they lend themselves to a type of pitch debate that would have encouraged early modern audiences to ponder the facts and merits of the accusations against the accused and render a private verdict. Within this body court ethos, the play invites its audiences to judge or consider appropriate punish for, punishment for the fictional case against Claudio for extramarital sexual misconduct. Recall that before Duke Vincentio goes incognito, he privately admits to a friar that the enforcement of strict statutes of behavior and decency had grown lax under his own rule, and something needed to be done about it. While fearing that he would grow unpopular if he were to change his style of rule, the Duke privately rationalizes that Angelo's precise or puritanical nature is better suited for a stricter enforcement of prevailing laws. Thus, when Angelo orders the closing of all Viennese brothels, drastic political change is imminent, as Mistress Overdone fearfully expresses to Pompey, her pimp. The authoritarian rule of Deputy Angelo's new regime as regards sexual conduct appears grave when Claudio is arrested for exercising too much sexual liberty and impregnating Juliet, to whom he is betrothed. Claudio speculates that Duke Vincentio's deputy has taken it upon himself to enforce an old, neglected statute to establish and exercise his new authority. And here he says, this is from the play, but this new governor awakes me all the enrolled penalties which have, like unscoured armor, hung by the wall, so long that 19 zodiacs have gone round and none of them been worn, and for a name. Now puts the drowsy and neglected act freshly on me, tis surely for a name. The very public nature of Claudio's arrest which would have reminded playgoers of public consistory court proceedings is signal when Claudio protests to the provost. Fellow, why dost thou show me thus to the world? This is when he's being paraded in front of everybody after his arrest, and when he subsequently learns that the public parading of his arrest was ordered by Angelo. Lucio's surprise over Claudio's imprisonment and Claudio's pleas that Lucio seek out his sister Isabella for support are expressions that tend to elicit modern sympathy for Claudio's plight. Indeed, we do not assume today that an unmarried couple's sexual conduct is the business of an entire community. But whereas Shakespeare's audiences may have shared our empathy for Claudio, they certainly would have considered premarital sex 
between a betrothed couple like Claudio and Juliet to be their business. In light of their regular exposure to body court proceedings, early modern playgoers would have found the events of Act I to be provocative, if not controversial, for several reasons. First, they would have assumed that Claudio and his betrothed Juliet would have been bound by norms of sexual and marital conduct similar to their own, despite the play's exotic setting in Vienna. Second, although Claudio and Juliet had not been able to secure a dowry yet from Juliet's parents, the couple had created a valid marriage, recognized by witnesses through mutual consent. And I, I will say this um, for anyone who's interested in, there, there are a variety of different ways a spousal can actually take place through words of present consent, words of future consent, um, and, and, and this, is, this is much more uh, complicated than I would want to get into in this paper. The pre-contract that Claudio and Juliet had would have been based on words of future consent, which in Latin would be per verba, per verba de futuro. And so most likely that, that's the one that, that we can assume that they were bound by based on the evidence in the play. So their betrothal, known as hand fasting, spousal or pre-contract, was considered legally binding in the first step towards cementing the marital bond. And third, Shakespeare's audiences understood that couples resembling the fictional Claudio and Juliet felt free to begin a sexual relationship after a pre-contract, but they also would have known that the church did not sanction the marriage until the reading of the bands and the church ceremony had taken place. While it is certainly true that the body courts considered sex between two unmarried people to be a misdemeanor, that might bring a mere fine or stint of public penance. Historian Peter Laslett notes that, quote, such punishments were less likely to be imposed on couples who were courting, end quote. In other words, Claudio's arrest for having sex with his fiancée might have seemed justified to some viewers, but only if the punishment were minor. Most assuredly, Shakespeare's audiences would have found Angelo's strict interpretation of a Viennese law prohibiting fornication to be extremely harsh, especially because Claudio faced the death penalty, if you recall the play. Moreover, the civil jurisdiction of Claudio's case, instead of a church court jurisdiction, may have also seemed highly irregular to viewers. Had Claudio's case been brought before an actual English body court, Claudio and Juliet may have been asked to do what the court asked John Martin of Oton and Robert Blundell of St. Ives, Huntingdonshire, to do on April 1530 in the local chapter, chapel, excuse me. According to court records, as Evo Camps and Karen Raber remind us, the couple was ordered to solemnize their matrimony before the 1st of August next, under pain of major excommunication. And that's a, that's a real example from, from uh, the records. In his book, Before the Body Court, Paul Hare states, quote, the church courts were not allowed to hand down death sentences, and those who came before them were rarely imprisoned. End quote. Moreover, Hare's study suggests that although one to three million moral and sexual offenses were brought before church courts, the incidence of premarital sex must have been much higher. In his commentary accompanying transcripts of court records pertaining to betrothal and its abuses, Hare explains, quote, the church eyes suspiciously, and no doubt with reason, those betrothed couples who though not actually living together, kept company without proceeding rapidly to solemnization." End quote. Yeah. Unlike Angelo's harsh threat of the death penalty sentence as punishment of Claudio's premarital sex, the body court of Char Charlbury, Oxfordshire, dismissed the case of William White, who in 1584 was accused of keeping together with Marie Gillette in one house. Presumably the case was dismissed because Gillette testified 
that Y, quote, is contracted to her before sufficient witness and meaneth to marry her as soon as he is out of service. The Oxfordshire court appears to have accepted Gillette's testimony that she and White were properly betrothed. The court also understood that White needed to fulfill the terms of his indentured servitude to prepare himself financially for his official church wedding. Whereas many audience members of Measure for Measure would have winced at Angelo's overly harsh punishment of Claudio, they would have understood why the deputy might have wanted to renew the enforcement of the Duke's fornication law. Catherine Eisenman Mouse argues that in the 17th century, when Shakespeare was writing Measure for Measure, an increasingly powerful group of Puritans or precisions argued that the church court's punishments were far too mild. She also states that the Puritans believed that the church threat, church's threats of disgrace and excommunication failed to deter the most egregious offenders who had no reputation to lose and were unlikely to fret at their exclusion from church. The precision's view of the church court's lenience toward sexual misconduct signaled a dim view of any kind of fornication, which was in keeping with the Puritan belief in the sanctity of marriage. Indeed, in 1604, just before or around the time that the earliest playhouse audiences watched Measure for Measure, ecclesiastical authorities revised canon law to exclude marriages that occurred without witnesses and without parental consent, which might describe Claudio's pre-contract with Juliet. Until 1604, clandestine or secret marriages were accepted. Camps and Raver remind us. It would make sense if the Puritans or Precisions had angled for this legal revision to canon law, since a narrowing of the accepted conditions for a valid betrothal might discourage premarital sex or reduce its frequency, as couples realized that secret betrothals had been that wide. In shaping his Act One scenario so as to indict one affianced couple's sex life in such an improbable fashion, Shakespeare, Shakespeare could have been urging his audience to consider the implications of Angelo's enforcement of the letter of the Duke's law. The, the play may have encouraged Jacobean spectators to ask whether the practice of premarital sex by betrothed couples was too frequent, or to consider whether the body court's punishments were too lenient. The play could have drawn playgoers' attention to how church courts were prosecuting sexual misconduct under King James following the enactment of the provision outlawing clandestine marriages. Even though Claudio never comes to harm because the Duke ensures that his life is saved, the provocative nature of the case against him could have encouraged audiences to ponder his dilemma on the way home from the theater. Moreover, the circumstances surrounding Claudio's arrest may have also seemed highly controversial, particularly if they resonated differently among self-avowed Catholics and Anglicans compared to self-avowed Puritans, and they would have all been in the audience. By proposing a case and punishment as extreme and provocative as Claudio's, Measure for Measure may have also invited viewers to ponder this question. If the Puritan critics of the body courts had their way, might Shakespeare's contemporaries eventually see harsh judgments carried out beyond the exacting of penance or the mere threat of communication? At some point, would King James's government decide to change the regulation of sexual conduct from a church jurisdiction to a civil jurisdiction, which would make defendants vulnerable to harsher judgments against betrothed couples who had sex? Because the existence of the 1604 canon law revision suggests that England had tightened the rules governing betrothals, I submit that Shakespeare may have engineered his play to tap into playgoers' personal experiences of the body courts to elicit a reaction to the new rules. Shakespeare may have also understood that the play's courtroom ethos could have resonated with spectators familiar with the Puritan outrage over the moral leniency of the body courts. 
if Shakespeare purposely fashioned his play's body court ethos to draw public attention to the 1604 changes to canon law, the prospect may lend support to Donna Hamilton's view that measure for measure represented a pivotal aesthetic moment for the playwright. James had assumed the throne in 1603. Shakespeare's acting company had been elevated to the position of the king's men. And therefore, the playwright had begun a process of situating himself in relation to a different monarch, one whose policies on any number of matters were gradually becoming known. Thank you. Cynthia, I loved your paper, um, and I was thinking about the idea of um, the Sunday morning courts, you said, you're providing great theater, right? And I, that just started me down this mental path, right? thinking about law as theatrical, right? And um, thinking about like Hudson's book, the, the Invention of Suspicion, and law in early modern England, um, and this idea of, well, if law isn't external and absolute, then maybe it's theater, which theater is making. Is theater real? Is it not real? Can you make something that is real? Are we just playing a part? Right? It makes me think of Hamlet, right? A part one might play, right? It's scenes. Um, and so I don't know if you can kind of speak a little bit more to that idea of the instability of law within the play, and maybe like the transitory nature of law. Well, you know, that, that's very, very interesting. I mean, you're, you're probably having all kinds of great thoughts right now. I'm trying to get on your wavelength. But what, one of the things I wanted to do, um, and I wanted to do more effectively you know, visually, was show you all a, a picture of an actual um, layout of the witness stand in Chester Cathedral, mm -hmm. where you can actually still see the, the stand where the accused would have stood uh, and faced the vicar. Um, I, just to your point, Jonathan Bay has written a wonderful article about the body courts in a, a series called Shakespeare and the Law. And he, what he does that's very interesting in that book is he actually cites specific cases in Stratford that would have occurred during Shakespeare's lifetime where men and women were um, you know, accused of some of these infractions that I was referring to in the paper. And he speculates that perhaps Shakespeare would have watched the way that the, that the women and the men talked during their pleadings. And for example, he, he would have possibly known that the bed trick that he uses so profusely throughout his comedies was actu actually was referred to in many real cases in Stratford mm -hmm. that, that people were actually privy to if they were there on a Sunday and a pleading was being heard. So I think probably if, even if, even if Shakespeare wasn't present at some of these uh, trials, if you want to call them that, he would have heard about them and he would have heard people repeat some of the testimony. And so I think, I think probably that engaged his imagination and he realized, and because of some of the court cases he was involved in, other than the body court cases, he would have realized that, that these legal defenses were theatrical. And so it would have, it, it makes sense that he would have worked in something like this. I mean, the bed trick, for example, in so many of his plays. Yeah, it's fascinating. There's almost like this meta theatricality to it all. Um, that, you know, life is theater, right? Yeah. You play a part, and yeah. how good are you at playing that part? It's just going to determine if you get out of that courtroom or not, you know? So. Right. And if you, I mean, if you, love, if you like Shakespearean comedy and you're familiar with the bed trick, you know, where one woman substitutes for another woman to try to trick someone into thinking you're sleeping with them, this, this was routinely done, apparently, and there's testimony to this effect, so it's kind of interesting that, that he was inspired, possibly inspired by those cases. Awesome. Cynthia, so uh, do you get a, a sense that, I mean, today, if 
you, know, you have a couple that's engaged and they get married a week after engagement. That would we would generally consider that too quick. Um, but five years is too long. Do you get a sense that there's the same? I mean, do they have a, a, a good determined time of how long do you need to be betrothed uh, before marriage, um, but at the same time avoiding, uh, you know, fornication? So, are you talking about it in, in the Elizabethan? In the courts, yeah, in the, yeah, yeah. Elizabethan, you're not, not in present day. No, 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 Elizabethan, uh, yeah. You know, that, that, that's a really good question. I was kind of afraid somebody was going to ask me. Sorry. I'm the story that I know. I, I would say that there are probably, it, it would de depend on the, the type of pre contract that they, they went into. Um, the thing that, that's so frustrating about reading about these real life examples and then trying to map them onto your understanding of, of the comedies and, and the marriage situations and spousals and the comedies is that there seem to be so many different kinds of possibilities. I think that even if there was a, a public witnessing of an engagement and there were there were uh, there was a guaranteed dowry to be provided. I'm not sure that, that the length of time really mattered. But what I can say and, and refer you to the experts, Jermaine Greer has a, a fascinating article on Shakespeare and the marriage contract and mm -hmm. the marriage contract in early modern in the early modern era, and she talks about how. Spousals, spousals were definitely a matter of negotiation of a community. So it wasn't just the couple that, that betrothed themselves to one another. There had to be the promise of money, of some kind of dowry, before the community felt comfortable with this couple getting married. And, um, you know, I, I'm not going to be able to adequately answer your question about, you know, when. I, but I think there was this expectation that sometime after the betrothal, the reading of the bands needed to take place and there needed to be a solemnization. But Shakespeare tends to be more concerned when the pre-contract is broken. Mm -hmm. and, and it is broken in an instance that I didn't talk about in my paper by um, Angelo and Mariana. Uh, Angelo breaks his pre-contract because he finds out, oh, she doesn't have a diary. You know, there's, and a dowry, excuse me, and, and so he, he dumps her, and then the Duke forces him to, to make good on his pre contract. Mm. And I didn't talk about that. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, you were talking about um, her uh, um, not speaking as a, a form of speaking, and I just wondered if you'd also look at the idea of, of kind of that public and private sphere and what was available to women as speech at that uh, a little bit, yeah. I really focused the bulk of my research on variations between actual words and what Chaucer was doing with them because his body of knowledge about avian life was really tremendous. Um, but in as much as my research has yielded in the public sphere, you would tend to be more silent if it's a mixed group um, as opposed to in an all female situation where it's a little more freewheeling and uh, it's hard to think of the right word for that. And similarly to now, really, in a lot of ways, like, you see this whole chain of um, situational appropriateness between each other is still occurring where women in their own social interactions are much freer about a lot of topics than they are and, but also I'm thinking of, of, of the fact that in mix it's seen as um, um, inappropriate in the sense of sexually inappropriate right. to be speaking in that sense. Right. Um, and with other women it's not that, but in a, in a mixed company it becomes also a kind of a sexually licentious uh, 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 act as well. Well, that makes me think of like 15th, 16th century conceptions of speech patterns, right? And speech being this penetrative act, right? right? So that if the woman is speaking, she then penetrates right. the back of his ear, 
Which I mean, <laughs> Hamlet, you're poison. I mean, it's like all over the place, right? right. But thinking about women as as like so just evil, right? right? They have this ability to penetrate straight to the heart mm -hmm. through the ear, right? Exactly. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so you wouldn't really see that kind of um, really free discourse um, in the Outward speech in a mixed sphere would not really be appropriate. And I think we need to do um, accepting certain circumstances. So, I don't know if that really answers your question. Yeah. And uh, we're back on a question for you too. Uh, with uh, looking at this as a, as a feminist text, right? How do you deal with the idea that he sets her up as no? In no way receiving anything, but always giving. Right? It is the idea that she is acceptable as a as a, sex, as a sexual object to be able to give more satisfaction to other people. Mm -hmm. um, well, the way that I approach the text, um, obviously, I was looking at it like you said from a feminist point of view, and. Madonna Philippa receives, I think, her satisfaction essentially through having that sexual freedom. So although she is giving, she's seen as somewhat of a, I guess you could say a sexual object, she's also gaining something from having that independence, from having the freedom even to be that object and owning it for herself. And being able to do as she pleases without um, impending doom, death, <laughs> being put upon her. I, I just wondered because of, for the lower class women, that idea of them as being a sexual object, that it was okay for them, um, not other class women, but for the lower class women to to be possessed by sex, and that that was all right, and that, that, that it was kind of their job to give in that way as they would serve you in other ways. Yeah, and that also um, kind of plays into the changes that were going on in society at the time um, when women were starting to make their way into a financial independence. A lot of women did end up, you know, going the route of prostitution, things like that. So that really uh, supports what you're saying about the lower class women seeing it as being okay to be a sexual object. So I do agree with you on that. But um, I don't think that's what Wakashi was doing with her. I don't think he's um, making her uh, less respectable in the way that he depicts her in the text. I think it's more of an empowerment than it is anything negative. But I think it's interesting too because like you talked about the quote with um, her having all this stuff left over and it's like almost punning on the idea of her sexuality as a commodity. Exactly. But it's a commodity that then she controls and doles out. Right? So it's like it's like one foot in one camp of that's something that's familiar, woman's body as commodity. But it's another foot in another a new camp, which is like, Try to take control of yeah, I am in control of this commodity, right? So it's like, which is really what good authorship is about, because if it's something totally unrecognizable, then your audience has difficulty interpreting it. But if it's like one foot in something familiar and one foot in something new, they can begin, uh, you know, and often can begin to bridge some of those gaps for people. Right? Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Any other questions for our panelists? Well, then let's get done one final. <laughs>